my husband always says, like, you just got to adapt and we have to embrace it and figure out how it works in our life because it's not changing. It's not going anywhere. And there are amazing things. Like I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram, but I love to see my friends who live in New York and their kids growing up because at least you feel like you can connect with them. You're listening to The Milk Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, and everything in between. I'm your host, Jennifer Tracy. So here we are rolling right into January. We're in the second week of January already. I want to thank everyone who participated in our 12 Days of Milfmas t-shirt contest. I gave away 12 days of t-shirts and then three top winners got a t-shirt and seven female authored books. That's seven of my favorite female author books. And that was really fun. And thank you guys for participating in that. And there will be more things like that coming up soon. So uh, I'll keep you posted. And also this month, the give, the January give for MILF podcast is an organization called Harvest Home LA. You can find them at harvesthomela.org. They are an organization that provides housing and programming for homeless women and their children. And it's really a beautiful organization. They really help these women find this nurturing community within this house. It's in uh, West LA provide them with the training that they need to be able to not only care for their children, but also get gain employment and give back to the community, either by working at Harvest Home or any number of different options. So uh, for every iTunes review that I get this month, I will be giving $3 to Harvest Home LA. And if you want to donate to them directly, you can go to harvesthomela.org. Another thing is, um, just wanted to remind you guys, we changed our rating from clean to explicit, not because we're constantly dropping F-bombs on the show, which some 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 guests do. Some guests, there's no cursing at all in the episode. But um, my team and I decided to do that because sometimes there is, and there's, there's only two ratings on iTunes. They're either clean or explicit. Just we wanted our listeners to be forewarned that sometimes that does happen. Sometimes there's an F-bomb. Sometimes the SH word comes out. Sometimes we talk about sex or sexuality um, and those kinds of topics. So just so that you know what you're getting into. But for the most part, we're really just talking. I'm talking to women and and wanting to dive into their their personal stories and their stories of success and their stories of motherhood and what happened before and what it's like now and how they got there and what they decided to do. And, you know, I'm just, I love this. It's very exciting to me and I'm so grateful I get to do it and uh, bring it to you guys every week. So, uh, today's guest is the beautiful Kimberly Muller. Kimberly came to me. She was a friend of Claire Stansfield, um, who was a guest on the show. Gosh, I guess a couple months ago now. And I, just felt so lucky when I got to go interview her and and meet her in her beautiful home. And we sat down and there was gorgeous artwork on the wall. And I didn't realize until she explained later that her husband is a well-known photographer and he had done, he had taken these photos and blown them up. And she talks about it in the interview, but contributed to uh, her books that she's written. And Kimberly is truly a Renaissance woman. She's one of those people that she could do anything. Like just everything she touches turns to gold kind of thing. And like, I just feel like there's no quit in her. (laughs) And that is, that is, uh, that's rare. That's rare. And, and I really admire that spunk and she's just very spunky in that way and very joyful. And I really admire that because I don't always have that spunk and joy. It might look like I do, but I don't always have it. And oftentimes I feel exhausted and defeated. And sometimes I still deal with my depression um, that comes, but I'm, you know, I have treatment for that. I've shared openly on the show that I take medication and I'm in therapy and, um, but I still deal with it. 
but that's me. But Kimberly is just a bright light and I feel so lucky that I got to share this conversation with her and now I get to share it with you guys. So enjoy. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. Thank Thanks. you so much for being on the show. Of course. Thanks we, for having me. Oh my gosh. Such a, such a pleasure. So we just met. We did for the first time. This is very exciting. And my first podcast. It's a first. What an honor. I'm so honored. So I want to kind of start from the beginning. Where are you from? Washington, D.C., right outside Bethesda, Maryland, actually. Beautiful. Do you still have family there? I still. My parents are there. My brother is there. Mm -hmm. My sister's in New York City, so still on the East Coast. And you, from there, moved to New York? No, I moved, actually, at 25 years old, I was doing field publicity. I was kind of a perma intern and was doing field publicity and promotion hired while I was in college by this ad agency that handled like field publicity for Paramount Fox and MGM. And I fell in love with my boss. She fell in love with me. She kept offering me jobs. She paid me while I was in college. And then when I graduated, I thought I was going to law school. She's like, please just come work for us for a little. She was doing a big premiere for a movie ages ago called uh, with Donald Sutherland called um, A Dry White Season for the Congressional Black Caucus. Okay. And I was like, sure. And that just kind of ended up being working there for a few years. And then through that, met these producers who I was handling East Coast publicity for their movie. And they offered me a job and they moved me in two weeks. I packed up and moved from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles. I was 25. So it's like I didn't know better. (laughs) <laughs> I thought, I, oh, I'll go do that for a couple of years and then well, I'll yeah. come back and I'm and still to here. to come to LA though at that young age is pretty exciting. Yeah, you it know? is. I mean, there's like, you have the nice weather. So that was a draw in Hollywood and all of that. So you moved to Hollywood and then what happened? Well, I was hired by this company. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was 25. So it's like, you know, great, I can do this. Yeah. The represented directors, you know, through a company and then left that company, opened West Coast offices for another company, doing more of the same, like representing directors for commercials and music videos. But it was more, I was kind of the boss because they were all on the East Coast and I opened the company out here. And how old were you then when you were the boss? 30? Yeah, like probably more like 27, 28 years old. incredible. And then... I was not doing anything like that when I was 27. (laughs) I was like... I think I was the towel girl at Burke Williams for $8 an hour. I went to Burke Williams all the time. That was my <laughs> self-care back in the day. I, I literally drive by and see Burke Williams. And I'm like, oh my God, I remember yeah. Burke Williams. Yeah. But yeah, so one of my directors, you know, I was doing commercials and music videos. And one of my directors was like, let's make this movie. And I was like, okay. So I like hawked my Cartier watch. I was fully employed by another company, by the way. And like kind of secretly started producing a this movie. This was your side hustle. It was my side hustle. I mean, literally they ended up suing me for, a pr- you know, credit really? on the movie. I mean, it, they just got, you know, a production credit, credit on I the see. movie. But I mean, I made a movie for 570000 I got funding from MDIC. I was a DC girl, so no, knew all like those weird companies. And I was a minority company, technically. I started this company called Conspiracy while I was employed by another company. <laughs> and, the name um, of the company was Conspiracy. The the one I created That's to make because it was all about a conspiracy. It was all under the table. Yeah, we made a, you know Hawk the Cartier watch. Got funding from MDIC because I was in a minority company. I was a woman owned company, which was a minority. And we made this movie, and it was so much fun. <laughs> and then. So that was a company that my a partner and I had, and we made two independent movies. And then I met my husband, and it was important for both of us that I kind of be home if we were going to have children and raise our kids. So I retired and produced my family, basically, mm. and had three daughters. Wow. And yeah. how old are they now? 14 and twins that are 11. Oh my gosh. I know. It's crazy. You really are in the car a lot. We were talking about that before I hit yeah. record. We were talking about how much we're in the car. Yeah. I think everyone in LA is in the car oh, a lot. Just, yeah. It's yeah. just part of the deal. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So you retired, I'm air quoting, but not for long because you're the kind of person. What's your start? What's your sun sign, by the way? I'm a cancer you're with a, cancer. a Gemini rising and my moon's an Aquarius. Oh, so God, I'm very yes. airy cancer. I'm a little bit of a weird cancer. And you don't stop moving. I don't stop moving. So you have your first daughter mm-hmm. and 
how long after that, like, well, first of all, how was your pregnancy and your postpartum experience? Did you have any I loved, PPD or? I loved being pregnant. I did. I know people hate me when I say that, even with my twins, I just, you know, I was wearing like short mini dresses and high heels Aww. just because I felt so blessed that I could carry these amazing, you know, and I know it's not the same and I, you know, it didn't, everybody's thing. Is everybody's different, different. Yeah. and you know, I didn't feel, I, I was very nauseous in the beginning. I literally ate bagels and cream cheese for months. Other than that, it was great. I loved being pregnant. Yeah. And in fact, because I had such a good first pregnancy, when I was pregnant with the twins, the second baby was breech. And because my doctor was kind of older, not one of these new doctors, he let me, you know, have them naturally. Because the second baby B was right. breech. Right. So he let me try and do it. And I did it. That's amazing. It was amazing. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you have, let's go back to when you have a toddler and two baby twins. What is that? What was that like? I just sat in bed for a long time. <laughs> I was like a milkmaid. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and was your husband available? Was he partnering with you? Yeah, what was that like? He's amazing, but he travels a lot. He's right. a photographer and he's right. on the road a lot. But, you know, during obviously that time we would schedule it. So he was here because I needed help. So he did a lot of stuff with our, th she was three at the time. Um, when we had the twins, Clara. Yeah. They did, you know, they were kind of the dynamic duo for a little while. I sat in bed, you know, being a milkmaid because with twins for a second, you can kind of feed them both at the same time. Yeah. But when they turned three months old, they were kind of like, get the hell out of my space. Yeah. <laughs> and there was no more. So it was like, you fed them. And then, yeah. but he was amazing because yeah. yeah, I'd feed them and he would diaper them and, you know, do get in touch with his Native American chanting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Good partnership. How long have you guys been married? It'll be 15 years on New Year's Eve. Oh, oh my God, New Year's Eve. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are you guys doing anything special? I mean, I hope so, but nothing's <laughs> planned yet. Right. We're always, it's, you know, because it's hard to get a sitter on New Year's totally. Eve. So normally it's like a family affair. Yeah. And maybe we'll celebrate down the road a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. That's amazing. Thank you. So, okay. So you have three little ones. You're you. You're, you're a go-getter. Obviously, you're the boss. You're the big boss at 27. Like, that blows my mind. That's so sexy. It's amazing. So you have three little ones. And at what point did you kind of go get get inspired to do? And we're going to go through all the amazing things that you've done and are continuing to do because it's very exciting. At what point did you kind of wake up and go, I got to do this thing? Well, organically, I... My brother was going through a divorce and I had a niece and a nephew and my nephew was three at the time. And it was actually, I guess Clara had been born and I wrote a book because I was looking, I was, I was the kid that was always scouring the, you know, the bookstores and stuff and sitting on the floor of a bookstore looking at books. And as an older person, I do the same and did the same. And I was looking because he wasn't talking, my three-year-old nephew. And he was just, it was, it's a bummer. Yeah. But I was looking for a book about perception because in life, you know, things happen that suck, yeah. but there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do about it is how you choose to handle the situation, you know, and react to it. Yeah. Like I always like to say life is kind of 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. Totally. So I was looking for a book to kind of send to him because that was always my favorite gift to give as a book and I couldn't find it. So I just decided to write it. That's amazing. So, because that writing is something I could do with three yeah. little children. Yeah. Because I could do it whenever I wanted. And I wrote a, a book about a little girl who hated her red hair because it was what I knew. And I hated my red hair. And I took a real life experience of a kid, you know, yelling at me, like, you know, when I was in elementary school, like when the lights went off for like an assembly or something. And he's like, turn off your hair. It's glowing in the dark. Aww. You know, you don't like to be different when you're little. Right. I mean, now I embrace it and I yeah. think being unique is great and I love my red hair. Sure. But when I was little, I wanted straight no, we wanted brown to be a part hair. Of, absolutely. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'm I'm almost six feet tall and I wanted to be petite forever. So I relate to that. And now like I'm yeah, totally it's amazing. cool with it. Yeah. And I want to be six feet yeah. tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um so I couldn't find the book. So I just wrote it. But then I wrote this book and because it was so visual I'm a very visual person. I every I thought in my head I could find like I'm going to go to art center and find some great student and they're going to draw the book for me and illustrate it. Mm -hmm. But I must have interviewed, I mean, upwards of forty something illustrators, kids, you know, wow. professionals, everything. Wow. But because it was so in my head, 
every time somebody gave me an example, it was so not what I was already right. seeing. So I kind of put it literally to bed with the twins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wasn't really doing anything else. And then because I had been looking for an illustrator, someone who had was at a management company and knew that was like, I think you should meet this illustrator. And it was actually a man. And it was such a girly book to me because uh -huh. the whole book is about, it's called The Adventures of Fifi and Noni. And it's about a little girl who hates her red hair, falls asleep at night. And I'm, I was obsessed with snow globes. And she has a whole collection of snow globes on her wall. And she obviously dreams that she goes into her snow globe with her little brother, Noni, and they have this amazing adventure. And they go to Atopu, which is utopia spelled backwards. Ugh. And in this amazing, wonderful, snow-covered world, you know, they make these amazing characters like Lama Roo and who's like Obama meets Al Green and, you know, all these amazing people and creatures and things. So by the end, sh her red hair saves the day in Ugh. this world. So by the end, you know, she doesn't know what her wish is any longer because before she didn't want the red hair. Now she, she embraces it yes. and likes, you know, the joie de vivre, as she says, and being she unique, empowered. she yeah, became beautiful. empowered by it. So it sat probably with no words for two years. And then my friend was like, just meet this guy. And I did. I had this amazing artist named Chad Addy and he brought the book to life. So it became an amazing book. And I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. It got optioned. Nothing ever happened, but it was optioned and it sat on, you know, a studio's, I don't know what they do with those books and those things, but Slush nothing ever happened. sort yes. of thing, yeah. Um, but it did empower me. And I was like, oh, it's fun and I can do this and I like this. And, you know, everyone loved the book. So I was like, okay. And then it just kind of kept moving forward. And then Clara was in first grade, I think, and we were on a field trip with her school at the, I think it was like the Natural History Museum. And it was an IMAX movie about under the sea. And she literally, you see the little seal swimming into the frame and it, it talks about, the narrator talks about there's nowhere further for, you know, the seals to swim south. And she literally, boy, she got up, put her hands over her ears because she's one of those kids, like when something's too much, she covers mm -hmm. her ears. And she was left. It was a field trip. All her little friends followed. So after, you know, all the moms were like, what do we do? What do we do? Like, how do we get our kids involved? Because obviously cleaning up the planet and the global warming thing, which, you know, was happening way back sure. then. I mean, that's 2013, you know, 2012, what? That's however many years ago, sure. six years ago yeah. or something. And I started doing a ton of research on like all the different organizations and NRDC, which does amazing legislation, but they weren't really doing anything that got kids involved. And my husband, who was already like a UN global advocate and already doing things to like help the planet and save the seas and things like that, where I'm like, who do we talk to? And we met this amazing guy, Philippe Cousteau, who has an organization called Earth Echo, which inspires and engages youth to shape the planet. Is he related to Jacques? He, he's the grandson. Oh my God, one of the incredible. grandson. That's incredible. And um, it was basically just one of those synergistic things. And because it was so hard for me to originally find an illustrator, I'm like, oh, I'm going to use what's in my own backyard and, you know, yeah. give him favors and not have to yeah. pay him. And so my husband shot the entire book. So we did a second book. I did a second book called Last Night I Swim with the Mermaid, and it's starring my now 14-year-old daughter, Clara. And Michael took all the, you know, the pictures and we self-published it. And we call it the little book that could because we give up, you know, the proceeds to Earth Echo. And so you see it goes into the classrooms of LA Unified and stuff. So you can see exactly where all the money from the books goes. That's incredible. Yeah. It's kind of great. If listeners want to buy the book. They can go to your website and buy the book? Yeah, there's actually, the Mermaid book has its own website. It has its own website, it's, but you yeah. can get to it through your website. Because yeah. I did that this morning. You did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you bet. Yeah, you definitely can. Because okay. it's not even like, I think it's really the Mermaid book website, and then it might link to my blog, which your I don't blog. think I've posted to, to since, you know, for two That's years. It's I don't hard have a to blog find yet. time. I know. <laughs> I know, I need to get I, I did. I was up. really good about doing yeah. that all the time, and I'm just not. Yeah. Now I just kind of like repost things yeah. that I used well, you, to say. <laughs> you did write two books, though. I'm just going to say. You did write two books, and open a bunch of other businesses, which we'll get to in a minute. So you've been a little busy, but, um, so that's amazing. So, um, and the name of the book again is one night. I swim. last night. I swim last with the mermaid swim with the mermaid. It's so beautiful. And there's some pictures on the, your, on the, on its website of what's inside the book. And that's incredible. And, and, but then the other book, 
did get published. Yeah, they've all gotten published and, you know, they're out there in the world for everybody to read. And the best thing about that, the mermaid book and Fifi and Oni, obviously, because everybody likes to go on an adventure, but every little girl loves a mermaid. So there's always three and five-year-olds and upwards of seven. I mean, I just read the other day to a bunch of kids. Oh, I'm obsessed with mermaids. Yeah, we're all 43 years old. Yeah. So, okay, but wait a minute. Between the writing Fifi and Noni and then the mermaid book, when did Fifi and Noni get published? We self-published it. Oh, you self-published. You self-published all of it. Mm -hmm. This is, I love talking about this because I work with writers and I, I love you know, the creative process. And especially when people get inspired as you did to do something that you'd never done before. You'd never written a children's book before. And I think a lot of people get stuck on that. Like, oh, I can't do it because, 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 because. And it's like, you just did it. And it took a long time and it took what it took, but then you decided to self-publish. I think that's so empowering and so amazing and such a great example. I was so tired of everybody. I would write something that I thought maybe was pushing the boundaries and the publishers would all be like, well, we love this, but could you just change this? I'm like, no, that was the whole point point. of it. And even with the mermaid book, I remember them telling me, because I showed it to people because I, you know, I had people that were interested and wanted it. But I remember them saying to me, well, you got to take out mantra. I'm like, but I'm not taking the word mantra out because I want kids to ask their parents what that means. Yes. You know, so it was like, I was over the rules and it's the same thing I did with, I made movies guerrilla style. That mm-hmm. was what I, I, like total control, guerrilla style without, the minute Hollywood got involved, I was not so interested in making movies anymore. It was yeah. really fun making really low budget independent films with amazing first time directors that then Hollywood, you know, gave three picture deals to. Of course. <laughs> so t- let's go back to that because I want to talk about the the two movies that you made with your conspiracy <laughs> production company. What were they about? What what drew you to those scripts? What drew you to those stories? Why did you need to tell that story? Well, it's interesting because the first one came to me from this wonderful director, Darren Stein, and it's a movie called Sparkler. And it was about, you know, a 40-something-year-old woman, kind of a hero's journey, but rediscovering herself and her life. Now, mm-hmm. I was obviously younger, but you know, she basically lives in a tiny little town, Victor, Vic, Victorville in her trailer park. And, you know, her world is turned upside down and expanded when she comes across, you know, three young boys on a road trip, mm. you know, just like kind of, and I think that that's a little bit of a through line through a lot of my things. And even my books is like, you know, life happens. And sometimes things that we don't expect and might seem awful at the time or unexpected or not what you think your life is supposed to do, you know, like kind of the hiccups that we have in life end up being the most amazing experiences and the most, you know, life-changing things that happen to us. And it's so important just to like, I know it's so hard and the older I get, it's easier. And when I was younger, I just don't think I saw it as clearly, Sure, but just to trust it. Yeah, that is the hardest thing because it is. Yeah. And and just kind of surrendering that idea because it is just an idea that you have any control because you have no control. No. And no, and the only thing we have control over is how we react to it. Yeah. That's all we have control over. Yeah. That's and true. I always say if I can teach my kids anything, like that's one of the most important things is yeah. just you know, somebody's always going to be mean to you. Oh, and yeah. life is not easy. But you have control over, you know, yourself, loving yourself, you know, taking care of yourself, all of those things. It's yeah. the only thing we can control. Yeah. And how you treat other people. All of that. You know, yeah. your kindness, your generosity, that kind of thing. Yeah. That reminds me of this story. <laughs> so my son came home from school yesterday and he put a dollar on the countertop. And I was like, where'd you get that dollar? And he's like, oh, you know, I gave this kid a piece of gum and it was my last piece of gum. So he gave me a dollar. <laughs> I was like, um, okay. <laughs> so I sat down and I said, you know, I said, I don't, I, I, cause I, I wanted to be really delicate. I didn't want to shame him. I didn't want to make him wrong or bad or anything because the truth is like someone gave him a dollar, like that's, you know, they, yeah. blah, blah, blah. but, but I also wanted to teach him like, no, 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 we don't, we don't take a dollar <laughs> for giving so many a piece of gum. So I don't remember exactly what I said. This was last night, but I think I said something to the effect of, you know, when we are generous with our things or our food or whatever it is, we don't need anything in return. It's, it's the gift of the feeling of generosity. 
And he did not like that answer. <laughs> he was just like, but it was, he said he felt bad. I was like, that's okay. Those are his feelings. <laughs> I didn't want to get too deep in it. But um, anyway, that just reminded me of that. Well, it's hard to, t- I feel like I'm always like, and I hate, you know, like, don't preach to me. I'm like, I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. <laughs> yes, yes. But, and I just, you know, there are so many of those concepts. And, you know, I think I, that's why I like to write these books and, you know, do what I'm doing because I can kind of hide that stuff, yes. you know, inside of it and know that hopefully one day they'll realize it because, you know, and again, our kids don't listen to us. They just watch us. No. So the best thing we can ever do is just be living examples yeah. of all the things that we talk about. Because it's so true. Yeah. You know, yeah. but giving is one of the best things. Like, I, you know, it's like when you're not feeling good, the best thing to do is to get off of yourself and to give to others. Absolutely. And yeah. And I always try to remind him, like, we are like super crazy fortunate. Like, this yeah. is like, you know, and they don't know. And no. I don't want to, sh- you know, try to tell him about the suffering that's going, you know, but like, this is just going to be part of what we do. And, you know, I'm explaining him the concept of being of service on a regular, anyway, without getting into it, but it is, uh, it's a challenge. And I, 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 I love what you're saying about kids and grownups. We just learn better through stories. So you've birthed three beautiful girls. <laughs> you've written two books and published them. You were a film producer long before all that. Then you create this other next thing. So tell us, well, I think that I'm always just kind of, everyone's like, well, what do you do? And I was always kind of writing and doing and like, you know, helping other people like fluff characters or, yes. you know, I was just, I, I, I never stop kind of creating because I feel like that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Even if it's crafting with my kids, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always just kind of doing and whatever. And then just a girlfriend and I kind of had the same idea at the same time. This home was always open. Like, we, I always entertained at my house. My friend's birthday parties were here. You know, we, everything happened here. Mm-hmm. And I loved it on my friend's kids' birthday parties. And, you know, basically one day me and this, my girlfriend and another friend who didn't have kids, we had five kids between us. And then we were meeting our friend for dinner who didn't have any children. And it was like, where do you go? It was like the only place to really go was to go to Bouchon and we could sit on the steps and drink rosé and the kids can run in the grass. Mm. Like, because I don't want to compromise. I mean, no offense to Chuck E. Cheese, but that's not where I want to go eat dinner. And it's just, it was basically a missing link in the marketplace. And it didn't exist, what we were talking about. And it was basically an extension of our own home. And we created it. I don't think anybody did. We all had other jobs. And... It was somehow we miraculously pulled off this beautiful space and we opened it. And it was, and I wrote the story of Ofudge, which again goes back to what we were talking about is that whole story is just basically literally a car breaks, a family's car breaks down in front of what they think is a crazy old haunted mansion, but turns out to be a house of wonders and magic Mm -hmm. with this chef, Claude Croissant, who, you know, has these amazing unicorns that come to life and bears that dance and giraffes that are waiters. And that's so fudge, Mm -hmm. you know, and basically it's just like anything is possible Mm. because it was the story of us, you know, three women creating this business and we did it. And now we're basically, you know, they call it proof of concept and we're pivoting the brand. We've actually closed our first location. Just there's a lot of construction across the street aside next door. We have another Ofudge camp, which is the Center for I Art, Music, and that. Play. Because mm-hmm. I went to, I took myself to Sushi at Wa last night, and I'm walking upstairs. I'm like, wait a minute. So tell us about Ofudge camp. So Ofudge camp is basically more of the play space. Like, you know, as you, when you build something, you realize like the needs or what's missing or whatever. And for us, the hardest part was definitely the restaurant. None of us wanted to be in a rest, the restaurant business, but mm-hmm. it was definitely part of the concept because it was important for us that families could go and you know, have a great dinner and a cocktail. And then when your kids are done in five minutes, there was a creative space with au pairs that would do arts and crafts and whatever. And so Ofudge Camp is more, and we were doing classes, music classes, all of that. Ofudge Camp is kind of an extension of that, which actually is more as a zip line and a climbing wall and more of a play space. You know, if we really had it to build all over again, it would be all under one roof. Um, And so Right. right now we're doing um, more pop-ups and um, brand partnerships is what we're focusing on. When you say pop-ups, you mean like, what does that look like? Basically like, 
you know, we're talking How do you to pop different up a restaurant? brands. Well, I would pop up in a restaurant that already had a restaurant got it, and got then it. bring in, you know, kind of what O Fudge does. Got like it. the au pairs and the crafts and the cooking and all of that fun stuff. That's so great. Yeah. More of an experience. Yeah. So you do that. Is that just in LA or are you? Right now expand? it's just in LA. Okay. Because I'm we're thinking hoping, like, uh, yeah, that, that's the idea. That everywhere. is the idea. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm just learning like when you build businesses like sure. that and they call it, you know, proof of concept, which we did. Uh -huh. And now we're kind of pivoting the brand and the model to make it, you know, streamline it. Yeah. They say for expansion. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, oh my it's gosh. It's fun. Wow. And so when did you open Ofudge? It's it'll be almost three years ago. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're busy doing that. Yeah. Well, and, and raising three teenagers. Well, two yeah. tweens and one yeah. teenager. But really my whole my big thing is like the writing. Like I just I finished my first middle grade chapter book that huh. was just optioned by a, by is we're turning it into a television show. Yeah. Yeah. That's so the, so those exciting. are the things, you know, again, like, oh, I just like this passion thing. That was this beautiful idea that was born, you know, from people when we thought, you know, it was needed in the world, you yes. know? Yes. And, but, you know, sitting by myself in a room and writing and creating is really where I'm most comfortable. Yeah. But you, you need all, like I, I sense yeah, that no, from you. I do. Because you're, and I'm the same way. I am a Gemini and I have, uh, what is my, I'm Virgo rising, Aries moon. So similar. When's I have a birthday? lot of the air. June 3rd. My eldest is, she's a double Gemini. Oh, June 20th. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of mercury, a lot of communication. Of a lot and then of, the rest of us, we're all cancers in yeah. here. My son's a cancer. When's his birthday? July 12th. I'm July 5th. My husband's July 7th. The twins are July 16th. No yeah. way. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. A lot of water. A lot of water. So good. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us anything about this chapter book or is it well, under wraps? Well, I can tell you it's, it's, it's not under wraps. It's actually in Galley. It hasn't even been published yet. It's the Paloma Peach picture show about, you know, a 12-year-old girl figuring out life. And she has elaborate Technicolor musical numbers inside of her head trying to figure out life. That's going to be the best TV show. Yeah, it'll be the TV show probably won't be a musical because it's more complicated. But I, my dream is to make that a whole musical. That's a whole other thing. But I mean, it's going to be yeah. on Broadway next. Well, that's what I hope. We it's hope such an so. obvious progression. It is an obvious. It, to me too. I know. Yeah. But yeah it all takes time. Exactly. So yeah. And then I'm working on my grown up book right now. Okay. Tell us about that. If you can. A little bit. I mean, bit. it's kind of, well, first of all, it's not in its embryo because I wrote a whole, basically a novel that's fiction, but like all fiction, it's based on reality. Mm -hmm. And then the people that, you know, have been working with me and, you know, the agents and such were basically like, you need to make this your story. This should not be fiction. So now I've gone back to the drawing board and I'm basically taking what I started doing it more from my point of view. Wow. So yeah. like memoir I mean, style? Yeah. Ish. It's hard. It's so hard. It's so much harder not writing fiction. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and making it like my story and stuff like that. Yeah. But but it's a love story. But really mm. it's about a love story about, you know, a 50 year old woman falling in love with herself mm. is what it is in a nutshell. But you know how all of your life experiences kind of bring you to a certain place. <sighs> Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I want to read that book. Yeah, I, I know. We all want to read that yeah. book. It's, we're all going to read that book. Yes. So, yes. This is amazing. Okay. So you're falling in love with yourself. You've written a bunch of books. You're going to continue to write more. What do you see like moving forward? I see, you know, like I, I've just had this conversation because I literally, someone just sat me down and was like, okay, but I want this. Cause I literally could write a kid's book every day. And I think I have like a stable of like 12, but they're not illustrated. Cause again, for me, that's the hardest part. Like we have lines warning last night, I swam with a shark, but I can't, my husband's so busy. I can't book him <laughs> to take the pictures. <laughs> He's just never available. Yeah. So, um, so I actually, in the new year, I've already set up, they've just set up a bunch of meetings with me with different illustrators. And I continue, like I probably last week met with two illustrators and 
you know, but it's, I wish I could draw. I have one of my children actually il- trying to illustrate one of my books because I was like, she's such an amazing artist. I'm like, oh, maybe this is like meant to be because that's the hardest part. I can re- keep writing them, but yeah. I need them to be brought to life for me. And that's really difficult. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, illustration is so specific in a way that like when you're writing a script or you're trying to produce a script or direct a script, it's a little different. You can sort of bring it to life the way it's in your head, I guess, but you also have this, you can let it go a little bit because it's three-dimensional in a way when you, I don't know, am I, I don't know if I'm making sense. No, it does make sense because you should see my vision boards for all of my projects because I don't, I need to like, you know, you can't, it's hard sometimes to describe and I am such an aesthetic person yes. and I am, am so visual, but I don't know how to draw. Yeah. So it's, it's challenging. Yeah. But like anything in life, the most challenging things become the most rewarding, right? Yes. And it, it forces us to go outside of our box and ask mm-hmm. for help and, you know, yeah. help see through other people's eyes. And then eventually you find the perfect person. Yeah. Like and you I did. think like that's kind of what's happening now because I don't like literally illustrators are coming to me now, which is amazing. And, yeah. And it might not be the right person for one project, but like, then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, I'm going to do this. And I'm working on a really cute little kid's book using actually these guys, because this is one of my husband's photographs. Oh, it's beautiful. And Sage Vaughn is an artist and he paints on top of them. So I've written a book called The Wild Ones. Kimberly's pointing (laughs) to a a beautiful giant uh, photograph of a giraffe. Her name's Mitzi in the book. (laughs) Okay, that's amazing. And there's painted um, butterflies all around her that have been painted onto the photograph. It's stunning. The Wild Ones is basically Mitzi and two friends, an elephant and a lion. And they don't want to go to bed at night and they all run away. And then they have these beautiful dreams, you know, with... Mm butterflies and stuff like that and realize, oh, it's actually better at home. (laughs) So growing up, did you have a lot of, do you have siblings? Yeah, I do. I'm the oldest of a brother who's two years younger than me and a sister who's five and a half years younger than me. Did you have a lot of magical experiences? Were you reading books a lot? Like what? Because you just seem like you were like born on fairy dust or something. (laughs) That's the (laughs) feeling I get from you. Like... Where did where did this the dog come trainer from? this morning said you're like a, a fairy child you got to stop loving the dogs a little bit less I'm like what do you mean <laughs> yeah because like, they need, need you to, to be an alpha boss. yeah I'm the same way yeah. with my um, dogs yeah I don't know it's so funny because no I feel like I grew up DC so conservative I have a mom who was Martha Stewart before there was Martha Stewart so she definitely was creative and you know she did flowers at the vice president's house when we were growing up and you know things like that and so and she was crafty and all of those things so I think I definitely grew up with those things you know and I laugh now you know there's an amazing Einstein quote he says that you actualize what you visualize mm. and I grew up in DC listening playing in my dollhouse and listening to the Beach Boys, and the only California I knew was La Jolla because my uncle Billy lived there, and I would get to go there one week every summer, and it was amazing. And like, it was he lived on the same block that Charles Schultz lived. Oh wow! And all the kids would all play together, and so I would go home and play in my dollhouse, and they all lived on this street down the street from you know the creator, and he and. They would listen to the Beach Boys and I'm like, look, I manifested and I somehow, I never thought about living in California, but then all of a sudden I find myself on the beaches of Southern California with three surfer girls and I'm like, oh my God, I manifested that, (laughs) you know? And I think that, you know, there's a lot to be said for all of that without even realizing it. Like, I think that I, I always wrote stories. And my mom says, I said, I wanted to be the next Judy Bloom. So I did do that, but then lost total track of that. Like I think sure. we all do in life. Sure. And now I try and get my children to read Judy Bloom and they look at me like I'm crazy and blubber, I guess. And I, they are God, it's me, Margaret. Doesn't sound the same. I don't mean, I have a boy, so it's, but he doesn't want to do all the traditional stuff either. He's really into the diary of a wimpy kid. And, and look, I'm happy that he's into any books. But it's funny, I was just at the bookstore. You were talking earlier about the bookstore. I went to Barnes and Noble last night and I hadn't been in a bookstore. I used to live in bookstores, especially in college. I would just go hang out at the bookstore or Virgin Records, which I don't even think exists anymore in like physical um, store. But it was so lovely just to be like wandering the book aisles and just touching the books. And anyway, I bought him um, the Chronicles of Narnia, the original. 
So I'm going to give it to him for Christmas and I'm sure he'll look at it like it's a lump of coal. (laughs) But I'm going to try to say like, let's read it together. Trust me, you're going to love it, you know, but he's really into this just different, I don't know. And it's fine. It's fine. Like, I'm glad he's into books at all. But um, I relate to that. I relate. Yeah, to that. it's hard. I mean, my 14 year old looks at me. She's like, mommy, we live in a different world. I get you grew up in that world, but this is not that world anymore. I'm like, and she's right. Like, I mean, I literally, they're like doing their research papers. They're like, well, how did you do it? Because the thought that I didn't have a computer or a cell right. phone, like, how'd you call your parents? A payphone. What's that? Right. You know, how'd you research a book? I had encyclopedias in the hallway outside of all of the kids' bedrooms in my house growing up. What's that? I had to Google what an encyclopedia looked like and then felt bad for the poor encyclopedia salesmen who no longer have jobs. Right, You know what I mean? Right. It's just, it is, it's a different world. And I, my husband always says like, you just got to adapt and we have to embrace it and figure out how it works in our life because it's not changing. No. It's not going anywhere. And there are amazing things. Like I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram, but I love to see my friends who live in New York and their kids growing up because at least you feel like you can connect with them. Yeah. But even on my post today, I was like, are you there, Santa? It's me, Kimberly. So it's my (laughs) ode to Judy Bloom. I love it. (laughs) You know, like, yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's, it's different. It's way different. I mean, my girls look at me all the time. We don't like reading. We're different. Yeah. I'm like, I know. But that, that's why like the Paloma Peach, the middle grade chapter book, I wrote I think as my girls get older, I keep writing older books because Mm. they wanted to read YA, which I thought was not appropriate for my 11-year-olds. But the middle grade was so boring. Yeah. So I was trying to push it. And again, you know, I won't name names, but some very big publishers really want the book and they wanted me to make her older. They said it was too sophisticated. Mm. I'm like, but But somebody made why, that's the point. Like, you know, they, they want me, I'm like, I wrote about a character who lives outside of a box, I'm not going to put her in a box. Exactly. So most likely I'll end up self-publishing that too. Now I'm a little sidetracked because we're make, developing it into a television show, but you know, I want her to be yeah. you know, in, in a well, book yeah. also. For and the sure. reality is most kids who are 10, 11, even my nine-year-old, they are more sophisticated now and they want to be more sophisticated you know, and, and listen, my son is still very much my baby boy and he is very cuddly and mommy. And so there's, he has that, he still embraces his childhood. He's not wanting to like go out and get a job and be independent, but he does crave that. And it's a healthy, it's a healthy movement for them at that age. That's a very crucial development. So, but it's so interesting. And I think that's the role. And you probably experienced this in the movie business a hundred times, like just you have an artist who's like, no, 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 but this is the voice. No, this is the voice. And then the business people, the publishers or the networks or whatever. Well, this is what's selling. And you're like, no, you don't know if this will sell. Just make this. <laughs> well, it, it's one of my the most challenging things for me because I'm still offered like, you know, do you want to produce this? Come on, I'm going to take you. I'm going to be the one who's going to take you out of retirement. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm going to be the one. And I'm like, well, no, I'm going to produce my own things now, I feel like. But I do read certain things that I think are the most beautiful scripts I've read. And I know that those are not only the hardest ones to make. I mean, they're the most important messages, but Mm. it's also, you know, to get the studios and stuff to, you know, get behind it. It's really hard. I was so grateful yesterday coming out of, you know, like the network meeting with them because I pushed it because I don't know how not to push an envelope Mm -hmm. and it's sophisticated and 12 year olds are doing things that 12 year olds are really doing, but a lot of networks don't want to show that. And they had two little notes, nothing to do with that. They're like, nope, the language is great. The feelings are great. And I was like, yes, you know, so I'm just, I'm hoping, and it's just so early on in the situation, but Maybe, just maybe, you know, mm. like anything, if you keep fighting hard enough for something, I be- believe that you can totally, so great. you know, change it. Can I ask how many women were in the room? Women it in the was, network? It was actually, it was me and my partner, the two women, and then there was four women and two men. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. It is, it is changing. It's changing. Yeah. It's definitely changing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Let me see what time we're at because, oh my gosh, yes. So we've come to the time okay, yes. where uh, I ask 
you three questions that I ask every guest. Okay. And then I ask a lightning round of questions. Okay, great. So it's really fun. What do you think about Kimberly when you hear the word MILF? I want a MILF shake. <laughs> so tell me about the MILF shake. I literally, when we opened O Fudge, one of the things that I always wanted to have on the menu was a MILF shake. And I always thought it was one of those branding items that could end up being in 7-Elevens all across the world. You know what I mean? Yes. Because, and, and to me, the MILF shake had all the Im- most amazing things that would make us ladies glow. Yeah. I love it. But that and- was also because you were MILF. One yeah. of the things that I was like, okay, I'll say yes to that because I <laughs> thought it was so clever. Yeah. It's just good to take that name yeah, back, you know? It's, it's, it is. And it's good to change like, you know, kind of what it is. I mean, not that it has negative connotations at yeah. all. You know, yeah. to me, it's, you know, it's positive. Yeah. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I can say no. Yes. Oh. And it doesn't matter. I always cared so much what other people said thought or if I was going to hurt their feelings or, but now I just want to be surrounded with people who make me feel good and who, you know. And who understand and support you when you say no. Yeah. Those are the people you want in your life. Yes. How do you define success? Balance. Mm, What does that look like? Where, you know, I sometimes, I don't know if you're, you know, sometimes I might be a little whatever, but when you're in the flow, You know, like when your days, you know, you wake up in the morning and life just, not that life is easy because it's not, but even when challenges arise, you're in that place that you can just calmly, you know, kind of attack Mm. it, go at it, whatever. And I think that, and I mean, we were talking a little bit about it before, but I think I was such a workaholic. Then I was a momaholic. And then (laughs) I'm trying to like, you know, kind of regain. And then I think I became a little bit of a workaholic again. And now trying to maintain the balance of where I feel, you know, satisfied and like, you know, this is enough for me Mm. and on all levels, like, you know, from being a mom and having the work because I do enjoy working, but I don't want to be working all the time where it's making me, I come home and I'm a bitch and I'm so stressed out that I'm no good to my family, Yeah, you know? And I think you know, for sure. I've been that in my life. Yeah. If you ask my kids, they might tell you I'm still that in my life, but I feel (laughs) like I'm achieving more of a balance in my life. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay. Lightning round. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? Cheetos. Oh my God. I love (laughs) Cheetos. Now, this is very important. Or a donut. Crunchy. Ooh, crunchy donut. No, crunchy Cheeto. Were you going to ask the fluffy or the crunchy? I like crunchy. And what but kind I of do donut? love donut. I just like a real, the, the, like the crispy glaze. Yeah, crispy, oh. clean, kettle glazed, whatever. So yeah, this is a plain one. Have you gone to Danny Trejo's Donuts yet? No, but I've heard about it and it's delicious, right? First of all, they, they will Postmate. I mean, you can Postmate it. it I've often, <laughs> this is a splurge. This is so stupid. I can't believe I'm just <laughs> sharing this. When my son has a sleepover, sometimes I'll surprise the kids and order the donuts to be delivered. <laughs> Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> and it's so, it's just like, they're, gourm- they're gourmet donuts. They're incredible. And he does, he has one that's like a tres leches. Oh, yeah. It's like a donut that's just been soaked in sweet milk. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's so good. Now you're going to have thing. me postmating and like doing <laughs> it. I mean, postmates has really changed my world oh my too. God, I best. love it. It's the best. It's dangerous. It is dangerous, but it, it is also really helpful. I know. Movies or Broadway show? Broadway show. I cry. Mm. I love the Broadway. Mm. I love Broadway. I mean, I, it, it's hard because I love both, but yeah. I have to choose. Me too. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? Daytime because I like a little spontaneity. Mm. Well, and for me, like I, I'm asleep, especially now that the, it's dark <laughs> early. Exactly. When it's five or six o'clock, I'm like, oh my God, is it, it feels like it's nine or 10. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know. I get really tired. <laughs> um, Cat person or dog person? I'm both. Yeah. I you mean, are. if I have to choose, I mean, look, I have three, ca- I have three cats, saw. three dogs and chickens. So I'm very, I'm kind of balanced in that area too. But if, I mean, if I had to choose, I'd probably say a dog. And do you, did the chickens give you eggs? Do they you use do. the eggs? Oh, fresh eggs. There's they nothing do. like it. Yeah. So good. It's great. Except that now the rats like them too. Oh. So I have to literally envision yay, yay, yay. Templeton from Charlotte's yes. Web. 
and that they have like a whole apartment complex <laughs> under there and they're all Templetons and stuff because otherwise I'll be so freaked out. That might be another book that you have. <laughs> Listen, I was just at the Kennedy Center at the ballet and there was a mouse We the, in the box upstairs. They let you have M&Ms and... I mean, but this is what happens to me. So a mouse, we, it was intermission and my husband left it like a plastic cup with the, we don't like plastic. It was not single use plastic, but of <laughs> M&Ms on the <laughs> ground and a mouse came into the box. And I literally in one second had the entire children's book about the mouse of who lived in did. the Royal Albert, Albert Theater at the Kennedy Center and wanted to be a ballerina. <gasps> because, <laughs> but I need someone to illustrate it. <laughs> Well, you got those appointments set up. You're going to find that person. That's amazing. That's amazing. Have you ever worn a unitard? Yes. (laughs) Definitely. And in fact, I offered up and ordered a silver unitard for my 14-year-old who is going to be an alien this last past Halloween. And she looked at me like I was (laughs) literally from outer space. You're like, what What could be more alien and perfect than a silver unitard? It was the perfect costume. And she looked at me like I was the alien. Hilarious. Shower or bathtub? Bathtub. Ice cream or chocolate? Oh, it's so hard. I guess chocolate. But I love ice cream. So both. Both. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? Five. What is your biggest pet peeve? People who aren't authentic. Mm. If you could push a button and it would make everyone in the world 7% happier, but it would also place a worldwide ban on all hairstyling products, would you push it? Yes. Superpower choice, invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength? Ability to fly. Would you rather have... A penis where your tailbone is. <laughs> or a third eye. A third eye. <laughs> I have a third eye. We all have a third eye. Like a literal one. Oh, a third eye. Yeah. Okay. No penises for you then. No okay. penises. For what me. was the name of your first Not pet? Not there anyway. <laughs> right. Dorgy. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Good. Well, I lived on a few, but Good View. Dorgy Good View? Dorgy Good View. That is, okay, that's your poor name, as you know. <laughs> so Dorgy Good View. I mean, what comes to me <laughs> is like, he's a gangster in the New York in the Dorgy 20s. Dorgy Good View and a lot of gold chains. Yeah, and he's yeah. got a Tommy gun yeah. and he's got a Rolls Royce. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> And a redheaded broad right behind him. (laughs) And she smokes Paul Malls. Oh my God. Actually, he follows her. There you go. There you go. There you go. Oh my gosh. Kimberly Muller, you're just a dream. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is such a treat. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kimberly. Next week on the show, we have Mae Lindstrom, who is the genius behind May Lindstrom skincare, among many other things. Wonderful conversation with her. So tune in for that. Also, uh, if you want to grab your seven habits of baller MILFs, it's a little ditty that I wrote (laughs) and it's on my website, milfpodcast.com. Go there to grab it. It's very entertaining. Just something that I learned about the habits of women who are successful and achieving and really sinking into their authentic milfiness and their authentic selves and their authentic power really it's it's the empowerment piece because that's what a milf is i think anyway uh thanks so much for listening guys i can't wait to talk to you next week and i hope you have a wonderful weekend